Well, good evening. My name is Phil Schomber. I'm the adult programmer for Hedberg Public Library. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce uh, our speaker, John Alferts. Uh, John is going to uh, share uh, some of the selections from his book, Always Remember, World War II Through Veterans' Eyes, which recounts veterans' experience in their own words and photographs. Would you please welcome John Olferts? Thank you. Well, before I get started, we have Veterans Day on Thursday, and I suspect we might have some veterans here. So if you're a veteran, I wondered if you might want to, to raise your hand and uh, to let us know uh, the branch that you served, when you served. U.S. Navy served from 1962 to 66 plus, attained the rank of E5. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Um, U.S. Army, Vietnam, uh, 65 and six, through 67. Thank you for your service. Air Force. Air Force. 70 to 78. 70 to 78. Wow. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you all for your service. And, and uh, that's kind of, if you don't mind, I'll take this off. But that's kind of how this project of mine started, as I was a teacher with the Department of Defense Dependent Schools, and I was um, in Bad Kreuznach, Germany, which is uh, about an hour from Ramstein and maybe 30 minutes from uh, Heidelberg. But we got a chance to visit many of the World War II sites. We went to the beaches of Normandy. We went to the, to the Ardennes Forest where the Battle of the Bulge was fought. We went to Dachau and Buchenwald and the topography of terror where the SS did a lot of their uh, torture. And Claude von Stolfenberg's office, and he was the German general that tried to assassinate Hitler. And then to Auschwitz. And at Auschwitz, our kids were just really little. And we didn't want to take them with to Auschwitz. So my wife and I took turns. And that's just, you know, the Nazis didn't have time to hide the evidence of the atrocities that occurred there. And so you can still see a gymnasium with plexiglass, and there's one like that full of suitcases. And there's one like that filled with artificial limbs, and one like that with eyeglasses. But then there was one like that with stuffed animals. And you know that each of those teddy bears came from a child who was probably marched straight to the ovens. And that just was kind of overpowering. And I started to kind of write letters to World War II veterans to thank them for their experiences and thank them for making the world a place worth living in. And um, what happened was, was they would take my letter, write, it, write me back, and some of them would share them with their buddies. Some of them would print them in their reunion newsletter. And so I might write one letter back, and pretty soon I got 10 letters 10 letters back, which I think was really fun for me because I was probably maybe a little bit homesick too, you know, being over in Germany. And um, it just was really fun to correspond with everybody. And I told them that if they shared their stories with me, I would really try to keep them alive any way that I could and in the classes that I taught. But before long, I wound up hearing from, I think, a total of 140 veterans which was more than I could ever just use in class. And I kind of knew I had to, at some point in time, write a book. And uh, I just started, uh, well, it was going to be my retirement project, but I decided I better get it done because uh, a couple of the veterans I stayed in contact with were still like, when are you going to get that done? <laughs> and uh, I, I decided I really better. So I, I got the book done a couple of years ago. And that I'm try, I kind of try to tell the story of World War II through their eyes and through their experiences. And this presentation kind of highlights one veteran from each chapter in the book. All right? So that's kind of how this project began. And so we'll hear from, from their words on what their experiences were like. And, and really, World War II was a, unlike any other event in history. I mean, it was really one of two times, I think, when the very future of the United States was at stake. 
you know, the Civil War, the outcome of that was questionable. Whether the Union would be preserved. And in World War II, it wasn't just whether the U.S. would continue, but literally whether democracy throughout the entire world would, be, would prevail or not. So it was an, uh, unlike any other moment in history. And of course, World War II for the United States began with Pearl Harbor. It's going to be the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor this year. Um, but it was a surprise attack on December 7th, 1941. And by the end of the day, 2,638 officers and enlisted men were dead, including 68 civilians. And there was another 1,178 that were wounded, and many of them suffering terrible burns. And Adolf Kuhn from Manteca, California, he was there at Pearl Harbor. And he had been getting ready for Sunday morning services when the attack began. He quickly joined other sailors who were all trying to cross the channel to their military stations at Fort Island. He said, we flagged down a small boat. It couldn't get close to the dock because of the fire, so we waded out to it. Twelve of us crammed in, our knees interlocked. The boat started heading towards the island. But the boat never got there. A Japanese pilot spotted the small boat and started strafing it. The bullets ripped that small boat apart, and I never saw any of those guys ever again, Kuhn recalled sadly. Now, he wasn't much of a swimmer, but Kuhn clung desperately to floating debris and avoided the fires burning on the black, oily water as best as he could. He watched helplessly as one ship after another exploded before his eyes. And he said, the thing that sticks in my mind is all those sailors' white hats floating in the water. He said, I swam that burning Pearl Harbor channel as I brushed countless body parts aside in the mucky, oily sea. He also made an ill-fated uh, attempt on to, uh, rescue attempt on the Arizona before it sank. And he picked up, and he got on there, and there was really nothing that could be done. Everybody on there was in very bad shape. And the boat was sinking, so he quickly got back off of it. But he picked up a quarter that he found on the deck, and he always kept that as a remembrance. Um, and Leo Gavitt, well, actually, Pearl Harbor was the moment when the U.S., you know, galvanized, and we were going to go to war. We were attacked, and we were going to go to war. Prior to Pearl Harbor, the U.S. was very ambivalent about entering World War II. You know, President Roosevelt had the good neighbor policy, kind of trying to do what we could to help the Allies, but there was a lot of divided public sentiment. There was actually a fairly strong Nazi movement in the United States uh, at the time. And so the question of which side we'd support was somewhat questionable. But Pearl Harbor changed all that. And Leo Gavitt from Stanton, Michigan, remembered that when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, that was a whole different story. I was tending bar on Sunday to help out a friend. The word came in that the Japs had attacked Pearl. I took off my apron and I told the owner to take over because I was leaving to go home and I was ready to go. And, and Gavin Gavitt enlisted in the Navy where he served on a destroyer, the USS John C. Butler, and earned five battle stars in western New Guinea, Leyte, Luzon, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Now, whoops, even though I'm from Rockton, Illinois originally, uh, I did not focus on writing to just veterans that were from you know, the state line area. I wrote to veterans all across the country. But um, some of the veterans I wrote to uh, were from Illinois and Wisconsin, and Gordon King was from Merrill, Wisconsin. And he enlisted and was going to become a paratrooper. And he recalled some of the training he received as a paratrooper with the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division, as kind of chilling for somebody who was just joining. He said, how to garrot a sentry with piano wire, how to break his back with a blow from an entrenching tool, where to st strike so he would die soundlessly. How to use your teeth, your thumbs, your knees, 
on vital spots. To be sure to hold the trench knife close in front of you, thumbs up, cut and slash, how to break his arm and kill him with his own knife. Colonel Sin, the commander of the regiment since its painful birth in the hills of Georgia, reminded us, y'all ain't going over there to die for your country. You're going over there to make that other SOB die for his. So uh, that was his remembrance of basic training. Now Jefferson de Blanc of Lockport, Louisiana, he was in uh, one of the first big battles of war, of, that the U.S. was involved in in World War II in 1942, Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands. Um, during the first six months of 1942, the Allies chose Guadalcanal, the largest island in the Solomon Islands group, for its first offensive campaign in the Pacific. If the Allies could take the Solomons, they could have an important base for establishing supply lines and communication in their campaign to defeat Japan. The Solomon Islands campaign became a bitter war of attrition as both sides fought feverishly for months for land, sea, and air for the strategically important islands. Now, Lieutenant Jefferson de Blanc led a six-plane section of Fighting Squadron 112 as it escorted dive bombers and torpedo planes targeting Japanese ships near Kalambangara and the Solomon Islands. When they came under fierce enemy attack, de Blanc kept fighting, even though his aircraft was rapidly losing fuel. In a matter of minutes, de Blanc shot down five Japanese planes. But in doing so, de Blanc's fighter plane took direct hits, setting into fire and spraying him with shrapnel. There was nothing he could do but bail out of the burning craft, um, parachuting into the ocean. He swam six hours before coming ashore to Kalambangara, which was occupied by the Japanese. Now he managed to elude capture for several days, hiding in an abandoned hut, but he was eventually captured by an indigenous tribe of headhunters. His story really should become a movie. And de Blanc was confined to a bam bamboo cage as the tribal elders decided his fate. But de Blanc was in the cage for a full day before he saw another tribesman arrive with a bag that he presented to his captors. Now in a 2000 letter, he described the contents of that bag and how it saved his life. De Blanc said, you see, I know exactly how much I am worth. One sack of rice. I was picked up by HUD hunters in the Solomon Islands after I had been shot down early during the Guadalcanal campaign. We were not winning the war then, and the native islanders are not stupid. Most of them during these dark days were with the winners, that is the Japanese. I was very lucky since I was traded to the Coast Watchers, loyal natives, for a sack of rice. Now the tribesmen who traded the bag of rice to save de Blanc, he later found out his name was Atito Loducolo. He had been connected to the Coast Watchers, a group of islanders who spied on the Japanese aircraft and ships in the Solomons and rescued downed Allied pilots. Because of the, his bag of rice, de Blanc's life was spared and he went on to fight another day. By the end of the war, de Blanc was credited with shooting down nine Japanese aircraft and he was given the Medal of Honor by President Truman. Now right around the time that I was writing to him, he was very excited because he is already planning on going back to, to, the, to the Solomon Islands to visit Atita. Atito Lo Ducolo again. Now Atito was 95 at that point and Jefferson was 80. And he said that our, our runway is getting kind of small, <laughs> but he really wanted to see him again and to thank him. And uh, he did get over there, they did get to meet again. And he said that was, we've now come full circle. Unfortunately, I have really looked for pictures of their meeting, and I've never seen one. Uh, so I don't know if they didn't take any pictures of when they got reunited or not, but pretty incredible story. 
He died then in 2007. So seven years after he once again saw a Tito. All right. Well, the first real uh, stronghold that we got in Europe was through Italy. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill wanted to invade Italy, which in November 1942, he had called the soft underbelly of the Axis. Now, American General Mark W. Clark would later call it one tough gut, if it was in fact an underbelly, because it was not very soft at all. Uh, Churchill pointed out that the Italian popular support for the war was declining, and the invasion would remain would remove Italy from the Axis, thus weakening Axis influence in the Mediterranean Sea and opening it up to Allied traffic. But it actually became uh, much more challenging than what they initially thought. And as you can see, even from that red line on top, that um, basically almost through the end of the war, we, were, we still had troops fighting in, in Italy. You know, it wasn't, wasn't the piece of cake that uh, Churchill thought it was going to be. And this next story comes from Howard K. Fay, and he was talking about this area on the Gustav Line, which was the first line that the Germans had fortified to um, prevent the Allies from advancing. And um, here's a picture of Howard K. Fay from Westboro, Massachusetts. And the rapid Allied advance in southern Italy came to a halt as the Allies ran up against the German Gustav Line. Running from Italy's east coast to its western coast, the Gustav Line capitalized on Italy's fearsome terrain, along with formidable German defenses such as minefields, barbed wire, and pillboxes to cut off the Allied advance to Rome. The anchor of the line was considered Monte Cassino, a 1,500-year-old Roman Catholic monastery founded by St. Benedict. Soaring at 1,693 feet above the Italian town of Cassino, Monte Cassino provided a bird's-eye view of all the main roads and river crossings in the Liri Valley. Monte Cassino was one of the most bloody battles of the war as Allied and Axis forces were in a deadly stalemate that dragged on for four months from January 17, 1944 to May 17, 1944. And then this is Howard's remembrance. Only 49 men in my company survived the 15 horrible days trying to isolate the Benedictine Monastery at Casino. American dead covered the mountain slopes. Morale in the 34th Infantry Division was at its lowest ebb at Casino. Weather-related storms and battlefields covered with dead depressed everyone. Morale was never top-notch because the 34th Division always had some units continually engaged in battle. The only escape from this routine was to be killed or badly wounded. I felt extremely lucky to have survived the Italian campaign. Now, adding to the misery of the soldiers, blizzards blew furiously through the mountains with strong winds and biting cold temperatures. He said the weather in Italy throughout 1943 and 1944 was horrible. Seldom did the sun ever come out. Weather-related illnesses were rampant among the troops. They had trench foot, diarrhea, pneumonia, and other stomach ailments. Faye said he himself came down with trench foot. He said, I took my shoes off and I could not fit them back on my feet. Six weeks at the hospital followed. The Allies paid a terrible price for Monte Cassino with 55,000 casualties, while the Germans suffered 20,000. In all, there were some 50,000 men killed on both sides. And of course, the, the defining battle of World War II was really D-Day, June 6, 1944, when 156,000 soldiers, 6,939 ships, and 11,590 aircraft, the Allies assembled the greatest invasion force in the history of the world for D-Day. The Allies needed all the soldiers they could muster. Everyone knew it was going to be bloody. Uncle Sam provided nearly half of the soldiers who landed on D-Day, with the majority of the rest coming from the United Kingdom and Canada. 
Their target was a 60-mile stretch the Normandy coast whose beaches were given five nicknames by the Allied command, Omaha, Utah, Sword, Juno, and Gold. And really, the, the result of D-Day was very much still at question. You know, General Eisenhower had two letters in his pockets on, on D-Day. One was his announcement, you know, if it was victorious, and the other was accepting full responsibility if the invasion did not go as planned. Uh, so he, he himself didn't know which letter he was gonna have to use. And another thing, just to kind of remember the enormity of it, um, President Roosevelt came on the radio that night with a prayer for all Americans and asked all Americans to join him in a prayer for the soldiers that were fighting at D-Day. So that tells you it's a pretty momentous event. But actually, the first people that experienced D-Day were the paratroopers the night before. And John H. Reeder from Selma, North Carolina, uh, he was one of those paratroopers. And he had gone from working as an electrician in a coal mine before the war to serving as a platoon leader of parachute troops in the 101st Airborne Division. We had a job to do, Reeder explained, and I was ready and my men were ready. Finally, at 11 p.m. on June 5th, Reeder and his men took off in Colonel Seek's plane, which was one of the few equipped with radar. Weighing about 200 pounds, Reeder found that by the time he put on all of his paratrooper gear and ammunition, he weighed about 388 pounds. No wonder why small men had to be helped to stand up in the planes, he said. It took just seven minutes to cross the peninsula from England to France, and once they got there, Reeder found that the Germans had quite a welcome for them. About three minutes after crossing land, it looked like the 4th of July on the ground. We could see tracers everywhere, Reeder said. My plane, though, was not hit by enemy fire. And this is what Reeder recalled about his landing. I landed in a big tree in a cow pasture. My chute tore loose and I hit the ton like a ton of lead. The first thing I heard was an American cussing. One of my sergeants was hung up in the tree. His name was Meyer. I told him to shut up or he would get us both killed. I stood guard until he climbed down the tree. Side note, the sergeant was with the British as an observer at Dieppe and was evacuated. He was later killed in Eindhoven, Holland. We were equipped with toy crickets. And if you watch like The Longest Day, the movie with John Wayne, and this is a very good movie about D-Day, but everybody's using their toy crickets. Well, he said, we were equipped with toy crickets to use as recognition signals. The Germans soon got some, and they made you a target. I threw mine away. People were running around everywhere clicking those crickets. My platoon was scattered all over the area, and it was very difficult to tell just where we were. There were Germans everywhere. And then the gliders came in. Now gliders, of course, by their nature, have no engines, you know. And uh, they were nicknamed flying coffins by the GIs for a good reason. They didn't have a very good success ratio, really. The gliders began coming in around 1500 on D-Day. Uh, they were dangerous enough to be in without anyone firing at them. There was good reason why they were called flying coffins. The Germans made the glider landings even more difficult by making the most of both the natural and the man-made defenses. Hedgerows were planted on top of mounds of dirt that were often five to six feet high. They formed natural walls throughout Normandy. Making matters worse, the Germans launched a counterattack just as the gliders came in to land. And Reeder was in the midst of it. He said, I remember firing a light machine gun with no tripod. I held it on top of the stone fence. The British gliders and the American gliders were a disaster. The Germans had poles set up in the fields that wrecked the gliders. Also, the fields were so small that many were wrecked when they hit hedgerows. The casualties were terrible. There was dead everywhere, Germans and Americans. I saw a glider soldier being operated on by a dentist. The soldier had all of his front teeth knocked out. Now, Bud Olson of Chowtow, Montana was one of the lucky ones. 
and he was in one of the gliders. He was navigator and the lead glider of the 3rd Battalion, 325th Glider Infantry on D-Day. As navigator, he had uh, endured an intensive six-week course at the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force in London to get ready for D-Day. He had to memorize the Normandy Peninsula, its roads, its towns, and its enemy fortifications. On D-Day, he was Olson directed the lead glider's pilot to the designated landing zone with the rest of the gliders closely following. But like so many of the other gliders, his glider crashed into the hedge rolls on D-Day. And this is what Olson said. As in most any well-thought plans, things didn't go right. As our tow plane was hit and we flew over the beachhead as we were forced to crash land far from our designated land zone. Our glider crashed in a grove of trees. I was the lone survivor. And by the grace of God, I was spared many times from then on. I can't even imagine surviving a plane crash and then having to go fight in combat. But that's what Bud Olson had to do. And first he had to find other, another unit to join because he was separated from his and um, it wasn't time for grief. He had to just go into action. And of course, the worst place to be on D-Day was Omaha Beach, which was called you know, Bloody Omaha Beach. It saw more casualties than the other four D-Day beaches combined. The Americans suffered approximately 3,686 casualties. The Germans had an estimated 1,200 casualties. Uh, these are some pictures of Omaha Beach. The Nazis knew this was a likely location for an invasion and they were well prepared for it. Defending Omaha was made easy by its physical features. Two cliffs on both sides of it, a stretch of sand three to four hundred yards long at low tide, low tide. The Germans fortified the area with mines and beach obstacles and an extensive trench system, mortars and machine gun pillboxes. Three Nazi battalions awaited the Americans. General Omar Bradley, fearing that our forces had suffered an irreversible catastrophe, seriously considered abandoning the invasion and evacuating the survivors before the Americans finally got a foothold on the beach and began moving inland. Now this is Walter Ehler's story of Buena Park, California. And here's a picture of him and his brother, Roland. Now, prior to D-Day, Walter and his brother, Roland, were called into their company commander's office in England where they were training for the invasion. The two brothers had enlisted together in the army in 1940 and had landed together in French Morocco, North Africa, and also made the invasion of Sicily together. In North Africa, they had served as honor guards at the Casablanca Conference, earning a compliment from President Roosevelt himself, who noted that they were both fine-looking soldiers, that they would make good replacements for the 1st Infantry Division. Now in England, the company commander told Walter and Roland he had three things to discuss. He said we only had a $5,000 insurance each, and that he thought we should increase it to the maximum of 10000 because he expected heavy casualties on our next contact with the enemy. Two, he informed us of the Sullivan Brothers incident in the Pacific, where all five brothers were lost at sea. It is now military policy to separate brothers and military units that were exposed to a heavy loss of life. And then he told me that he was transferring me to Company L, 18th Infantry Regiment. The two brothers waved goodbye to each other at the port of embarkation in Weymouth, England, as they left in separate units for the same destination, Omaha Beach. Ehlers had been named staff sergeant of a 12-man squad, part of the 18th Infantry Regiment. He was the only soldier who had seen previous combat. His platoon left England on the night of June 5th in an LCI ship headed for Omaha Beach. And this is what he said. We were supposed to be in the second wave. 
However, our commander received the message that the first wave was pinned down, that they needed more men on the beach immediately. When the first wave of salt bolts returned, they came to our ship for the men to be sent to the beach immediately. My squad and I were chosen for this event. We went down rope ladders into the assault boats and immediately proceeded to the beach landing area, in our case, Omaha Beach. We were not prepared to witness the chaos, the horror, the death, the injuries, and the wreckage that lay before us on that beach. We came in shortly after 9 a.m. ahead of the second wave. I call our landing the intermittent wave. Our boat hit a sandbar. It was as far as we could go. The ramp went down. We ran off the ramp into the water about six feet deep. A couple of the men in my squad found it over their heads. We had to pull them to where they could get their feet on the sand and their heads out of the water. As soon as we got to the beach, the men wanted to lay down. I told them that we had to get off the beach or we would all be killed. I got them to follow me up a path suggested by the beach master. It was made by the first wave as they attempted to cross the beach. There were mines from the beach to the bottom of the hill. The men had stepped on the mines. Many of the men were killed and wounded. As we went up this trail, we passed many of the dead and wounded. As we came near the bottom of the hill, there was a roll of wire that had not yet been blown. We found two Bangalore torpedo men in a shielded area. They informed us that they were pinned down. I informed them that we had, that we needed the wire blown, that we would fire up at the trenches to keep the Germans down while they would blow up the wire. They indeed were pinned down because as soon as they moved to put the torpedo under the wire, they were fired on. One of them getting killed, the other was able to blow the wire. As soon as the wire was breached, I rushed up the hill with my men following and got into the trenches. We captured the gun emplacement and four German soldiers. Ehlers would become one of only 12 men who participated in D-Day to receive the nation's highest honor, the Medal of Honor, and one of only three who lived through the invasion to receive it. So only 12 men who participated in D-Day were recognized with the Medal of Honor, and only three of those actually lived through the invasion to receive it. Near Ganville, France, Ehlers single-handedly took out a several machine gun nests trained on his squad. When his platoon came under heavy fire, he single-handedly covered their withdrawal while carrying a wounded rifleman to safety. He explained in his letter, well, first, because my men had no previous combat experience, and second, because I always lead my men in combat. I was the first to come in contact with the enemy patrol, which I knocked out myself. I then had my men fix their bayonets on their rifles and had them follow me. I came upon a machine gun nest. I knocked it out before my men caught up with me. I could not wait to have someone help me when I could do it myself, and I am sure that if I hesitated in doing what I did, the enemy could have, could have had time to get into a position to cause even more casualties. But the medal was bittersweet. Walter's brother Roland was one of the thousands of Americans who died on Omaha Beach. His landing craft struck by an artillery shell as it went ashore. When his brother's company commander gave Ehlers the news, he went to pieces for the first and only time during the war. Walter Ehlers may have been a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, but the bravest man he said he ever met was his brother Roland, and he didn't leave Omaha Beach. Now Samuel Ehrlich from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, kind of remembered what life was like for the, for the GI in combat. And he said soldiers spent their nights in whatever shelter they could find. Foxholes, bushes, tanks, tents, and if they were really lucky, maybe a barn or a house, wherever they found themselves at the day's end. During combat, foxholes were more likely to be used. Most foxholes were dug for two soldiers so that one could get some sleep while the others stayed alert. Samuel Ehrlich recalled life in the foxhole. He said, the hole is deep enough to stand up and fire your weapon over the side. You are less of a target with only your head and your arms showing. It also is protection against artillery fire unless you get a direct hit because when the shell explodes near you, the fragments usually expel outward and upward. Although they provided much needed protection, conditions in the foxholes were often not very pleasant. 
Ehrlich recalled, in rainy weather, the foxholes filled with water and made your feet very uncomfortable, sometimes leading to trench foot. Side by side in their foxholes, soldiers usually developed close friendships, which helped ease their loneliness. Most soldiers generally had a buddy they preferred to stay with. Ehrlich was no exception. He said he always liked to room with a fellow soldier named Ted Lynn of Seattle. He carried a Browning automatic rifle, which had more firepower than a rifle. Now, whether in their foxholes or in the battlefield, soldiers found their helmets to be essential gear and had were very versatile. Not only did the helmets protect a GI's head, they could also be used for bathing, shaving, and as a lunch pail. Samuel Ehrlich recalled that there were other less pleasant uses for helmets when soldiers were pinned down inside foxholes. Bowel movements in a foxhole were also extremely difficult, necessitating the use of the steel helmet and tossing it over the side. Now, I just don't know if you'd really want to do that in here or not, but <laughs> it must have done it at some point in time. And then Iwo Jima was from February 19th to March 26, 1945. With its barren lunar landscape, it may have seemed insignificant, but with two Japanese airstrips and another under construction and a Japanese radar station, the island was anything but. Once secured, Iwo Jima's airstrips could become an important base for American long-range fighters from which they could escort the bombers whose missions to Japan were becoming more and more frequent. In one month, the Battle of Iwo Jima, referred to by the GIs as the meat grinder, had cost 6,821 American lives and some 18,000 wounded. The losses for Japan was even worse. Of General Kiribati's 21,000 soldiers, all but 216 were killed. In the final days, Banzai suicide attacks struck terror in the hearts of the Marines, but ultimately did more damage to the Japanese forces. One Banzai attack alone resulted in nearly 800 Japanese fatalities. Now John Snyder had a very poignant story uh, and one that really resonated with me and I actually had that story on the back of the book, on the back cover. But John Snyder's machine gun squad was tasked with setting up a perimeter and linking up with frontline troops to form a defense for the night. The machine gun squad was at the base of a Japanese anti-aircraft emplacement, which was firing in an airfield the Americans had constructed. Snyder recalled, the machine gun squad decided that being on the high ground would give them an advantage. Sergeant George Barlow, an original member of G Company 2nd Battalion, 24th Marines, insisted on leading the squad since he had the most combat experience. Snyder said, we were very quiet as we climbed up into the emplacement and discovered a dead Jap over the breach of the AA gun. Fearing the decomposing Japanese corpse might be a booby trap, the Marines of G Company didn't move him. They planned to hold the position by using their hand grenades and carbine fire. As we settled down and positioned ourselves, we noticed a fire raging in a cave nearby and Japs began to move around inside the cave perhaps attempting to put out the fire. At that moment, we were spotted and our position was no longer a secret. A concussion grenade was thrown by one of the Japanese soldiers and it landed on the ledge directly in front of George Barlow. Reacting immediately, Sergeant Barlow yelled, grenade, and crawled quickly towards it. The grenade was rolling right towards Snyder, who painfully described how Sergeant George Barlow sacrificed himself to save his squad. Sergeant Barlow was on his hands and knees moving towards it. He covered it with his body and it exploded. I moved towards him. I turned him over and I could see the massive wound that he had received. His lower torso was blown away and there was no movement in either leg. I cradled his head in my arms and he looked up at me and he said, how bad am I hit? I said, pretty bad, George. And I told someone in the squad to get a corpsman. No one moved. Then I realized I couldn't expect any of them to go out in the darkness looking for a corpsman. That would be certain suicide. Sergeant Barlow looked up at me and said, you're not going to leave me here to die. And I answered, no, George. 
We exchanged a few grenades, but they had the cave for cover, and we were unprotected. Soon another grenade landed as we dove to get out of the way. Private First Class O'Dwyer from Ohio had part of his toes blown off. We decided to abandon this position, and we moved Sergeant Barlow and Private O'Dwyer to the base of the AA position, and Snyder went for help giving the password repeatedly until he found the rest of G Company and its Captain McCarthy, who asked him if Sergeant Barlow had a chance. Snyder told him he didn't think Sergeant Barlow could last until morning without help. Captain McCarthy grimly replied that the conditions were too dangerous. He couldn't order a corpsman to go back with him to help Sergeant Barlow. Remembering his promise to Sergeant Barlow, the friend who had just saved his life, Snyder knew he had to get back to him. As he crept back to his squad, he became disoriented in the black night. At one point, I actually entered the cave, which was on fire with the exploding ammo. Upon hearing the Japanese soldiers' voices, I turned around and I ran the hell out of there. I knew I was close to the squad location and to Sergeant Barlow and Private O'Dwyer. Once I joined the squad, we waited until daybreak, and I never knew the exact moment that George Barlow died. Now, nearly half of the Marines who served at Iwo Jima were killed or injured. All this occurred on an island that was just five miles long and two miles across. Snyder tried to get his friend the medal that he deserved after, after the combat was over. They asked if anyone on board the ship could verify my story when he told the story about what Barlow had done. I told them that I was the only one that survived that horrible nightmare. Then they asked, are you positive that Sergeant Barlow intentionally threw himself on that grenade to protect the rest of the squad? I replied that the area was so confined since there was just five of us, there was no place to move, and he made the decision to locate the grenade and cover it, thus protecting the rest of us. It was all over my interview with them in a matter of minutes. They concluded that since I couldn't definitely prove he fell on the grenade to save us from the injury, that his act was just an unfortunate incident. I have lived with my guilt all these years that I did not try to contact others to see if we could get Sergeant Barlow the honor he rightfully deserved for his act of heroism. But John Snyder did tell his story every chance he got to every group that he could tell it. And I kind of think it's a privilege to be able to share it still today. Um, but then the Battle of the Bulge was in the end of December of 1944. As it drew to a close, it seemed like the Nazis were on the run everywhere. British Field Montgomery, Marshal Montgomery declared that the enemy is at present fighting a defensive campaign on all fronts. His situation is such that he cannot stage any major offensive operations. Field Marshal Montgomery was very wrong um, because within a day of his remarks, the Germans mounted their largest counteroffensive yet in the Western Front. 30 divisions amassed along an 80-mile line with 1,000 tanks and 1,500 aircraft. Amazingly, the Germans assembled 500,000 troops. Allied reinforcements were rushed in to defend the Ardennes Forest. Even troops back home in the U.S. found they were reassigned. Eventually, the Americans assembled some 600,000 U.S. soldiers to oppose the Germans. And the Battle of the Bulge became the largest battle ever fought by the U.S. Army. Now, Arnold Dutch Nagel was a paratrooper who actually had four combat jumps in World War II. By the time of the Battle of the Bulge, he had already jumped at Sicily, he had jumped to Operation Market Garden. He had jumped on D-Day. And then, um, I don't know, I'm forgetting one of those. <laughs> one of the four, I can't remember. But um, he was at the Battle of the Bulge, and he remembered the heavy snowfall and extreme cold. His 505th of the 82nd Airborne Division had been rushed by truck into Belgium to support the GIs who were under siege there. Nagel recalled none of them were prepared for the brutal weather. On December 22nd, the temperature dropped and it began to snow again. It snowed at least 12 inches. On the occasions when the temperature fell below zero, it was a constant struggle to keep hands, feet, and ears from freezing. 
We had to sleep in the snow and we slept with all we could possibly have on to keep us from freezing as we had no shelter. Uh, he said that their uniforms amounted to little more than summer clothing and one of the most bitter cold and wet winters in Belgium. We didn't even have our parachutes to help us keep warm because they had been transported by truck and to help. He said that we would sleep in rolls and change places on the ends to try to keep warm. Um, but if the conditions were bad, the many lumps in the snow, dead Americans and German soldiers were a sobering reminder that things could always get worse. Now Nagel, he um, participated, especially when the uh, 50th anniversary of World War II came along. He participated in a number of reunion jumps. He went back to, to Normandy with a return to Normandy group and he jumped there. And then he did five more jumps. But on August 16th, 2000, um, he was jumping in Fayetteville, North Carolina to recognize an opening of a new World War II museum. And he told his friends that he had kind of a bad feeling about that jump. And he jumped and his chute didn't open properly and he hit the ground really hard and, and that's how he died. Uh, he was uh, 79 years old. And Jose M. Lopez was at the Battle of the Bulge. He had been born in Santiago, Jutlan, Mexico. He had actually come to the United States illegally as a 13-year-old, falsifying his birth certificate so he could join the Marines and serve his adopted country. On December 17th, he was near Krinkert, Belgium, when he heard German tanks and infantry coming, and he feared they would soon overrun his company. And this is what he said. I had five boxes of ammunition at the Battle of the Bulge. Someone helped me carry the five boxes of ammunition. My job was to guard the road valley while my company rested at the foot of the forest. Captain McDonald was in command. I was in my foxhole several hours, approximately three to five hours. I was cold and I was tired. I heard the German tanks coming in the distance. I had to decide when to start shooting my machine gun. When I saw the German troops, I started firing my machine gun single-handedly. The tank was searching for me, and it started shooting its shells towards me. One shell hit so close that I was thrown backwards out of my foxhole. After a little while, I got my machine gun again, got back in the foxhole, and started shooting again. I stopped only after my supply of ammunition was exhausted. While firing his machine gun, Lopez kept changing positions and praying to the Virgin of Guadalupe that he would be spared. He said the tank also continued with his aim at me during my firing, plus the German soldiers were advancing. I estimate the time that I was shooting at the Germans was about 45 minutes. I was now out of ammunition, and I decided to retreat. I picked up my machine gun, and I went looking for my company. The next day, my company commander went back to see what I did for my unit. They counted more than 100 dead Germans. The next thing I knew, I was being recommended for the Medal of Honor. My friends were very happy that I saved their lives because they knew they would not be alive today if I had not fired my machine gun. And he was obviously very good at that. Um, Okinawa whoops, um, was the costliest battle in the Pacific. Um, began on April 1st, 1945. During the 83-day battle, 110,000 Japanese were killed and another 10,755 taken prisoner. Over 900 kamikaze planes were sacrificed as they sank 36 U.S. Navy ships and damaged another 368. The battle cost the U.S. Army and Marines 7,613 killed and the Navy nearly 5,000 dead. We had over 58,000 casualties. And Clarence Kraft from Fayetteville, Arkansas, led an attack on May 31, 1945 on Hin Hill in Okinawa, which served as a strategic center of the Japanese line of defense. For 12 days, American GIs had been pinned down, suffering heavy casualties as they had tried to take the hill. Kraft was angry that so many of his buddies were being shot down as they tried in vain to penetrate the Japanese defenses. In a 1999 letter, he described his thinking. I was mad at the Japanese, and we had been pinned down too long. 
The United States Army trains men to handle themselves in such matters. Without the good training, I could not have survived. Kraft was sent as a forward scout and frontline rifleman and advanced to his company to test the enemy resistance. Moving out in a diamond formation, the group immediately drew fire from the Japanese machine guns and grenades. Three of the five men were injured. Driven by his anger and his fright, Kraft wrote, anybody that isn't afraid in a situation like that is just plain nuts. He went on a one-man attack. His Medal of Honor citation said, he stood up in full view of the enemy and began shooting with deadly marksmanship wherever he saw a hostile movement. He steadily advanced up the hill, uh, making Japanese, taking Japanese soldiers with rapid fire, driving others to cover in their strongly disposed trenches, unhesitatingly facing alone the strength that had previously beaten back attacks in the bata of battalion strength. Standing atop Hen Hill, Kraft was running out of everything. The other men that was left in my squad helped me by passing me grenades and satchel charges up from the base of the cliff, he said. He also directed his comrades on where to throw their grenades. Adrenaline pumping, Kraft fought on charging up to the main enemy trench. His citation described what happened next. Straddling the excavation, he pumped rifle fire into the Japanese at point-blank range, killing many and causing the others to flee down the trench. Pursuing them, he came upon a heavy machine gun which was still creating havoc in the American ranks. With rifle fire and a grenade, he wiped out this position. By the time the Japanese were in complete rout and American forces were swarming over the hill, he followed the retreating enemy to the mouth of a cave, and there he tossed a satchel charge into the cave, sealing the Japanese in what became their tomb. They said his attack had far-reaching consequence, for Hin Hill was the key to the entire defensive line, which rapidly crumbled after his utterly fearless and heroic attack. But he would later serve in the Korean War as well, but he became a 100% disabled veteran. And he did suffer from the effects of post-traumatic stress syndrome the rest of his life. Um, he spent a lot of time at the VA hospital, um, both getting treatment for himself and visiting others. And he said that, I would really like to forget the war. I just had a job to do. I was in the right place at the right time. I just lucked out. And Desmond Doss, of course, his story, uh, famous that Mill Gibson made a movie about Desmond Doss just a few years ago um, that drew a lot of attention to him again. And he was a conscientious objector uh, who um, received the Medal of Honor at, for his actions at Okinawa. He helped to to save 75 soldiers by lowering them from the 400-foot-high Maeda escarpment during the Battle of Okinawa. Um, he refused to handle a gun, but he rescued one wounded soldier after another, lowering them 35 feet below the escarpment in a rope-supported litter tied to a tree stump, all the while under enemy fire as he did so. And uh, he was a deeply religious person. Uh, in fact, he was nicknamed Doc and Preacher by the other GIs because he enjoyed reading the Bible and said that he had to do God's will and that the um, important thing to do in life is to live up to what you believe is right. And he is only one of two conscientious objectors who ever received the Medal of Honor. Corporal Thomas Bennett received it for his service posthumously as an Army medic in Vietnam. And I wrote to Vernon Baker, who uh, received the Medal of Honor quite a bit after World War II, um, when the Army kind of investigated why no African-American soldiers ever received the medal, uh, why so few minorities did. They uh, did decide that Vernon Baker should have received it, and he had been promised it at the time. And so more than 50 years after his courageous service, Vernon Baker of St. Marie, Idaho, became the only living African-American World War II soldier to receive the Medal of Honor. He had been a platoon leader with Company C of the 370th Infantry Division, 92nd Division, when his platoon came under heavy artillery barrage during the pre-dawn hours of April 5, 1945, on Hill 10 of a German mountain stronghold of Castle Aginalfi, in Italy. In his letter to me in 1997, 
Baker recalled the ominous setting of the battle. As Baker's platoon came within 250 yards of the castle, he spotted a telescope sticking out of a bunker slit. Baker quickly pointed his M1 into the slit and emptied it, killing the two Germans inside the bunker. Baker soon found a camouflage machine gun nest and killed the two Germans manning it. When Baker found his company commander, Captain John Runyon, a German threw a hand grenade at them both. Fortunately for Baker and Runyon, the grenade was a dud and bounced off Runyon's helmet. The German who threw it wasn't as fortunate. Baker shot and killed him. Before he was done, Baker would blast open another German hideout with his hand grenade and kill the two Germans inside it with a submachine gun. Despite Baker's heroics, his platoon was being chewed up by the German artillery. Nonetheless, Baker was shocked when Captain Runyon ordered the troops to withdraw and told Baker that he was going to go get reinforcements. Captain Runyon was. Half a century later, Baker did not mince words about what he thought of Captain Runyon. First, commanding officers do not abandon their command on the field of battle to go for reinforcements. A move of that sort is designated to a trusted subordinate. A CO's job is to stay and command. That is why he is given a command. My feelings were, and I make no apologies for them, that Captain Runyon was a cowardly son of a bitch, and myself and my comrades would stick it out until we were supplied with reinforcements, or we were dead because at that time we were heady with the sense of accomplishment and that we had taken ground that had been denied to larger forces for months. We did not want to retreat. By the time Baker got down to the bottom of the hill and vomited, only seven of his 25-man platoon still survived. But they had killed 26 Germans, destroyed six machine gun nests, and two observer posts, and four dugouts. Baker couldn't believe he survived it. He said, I was not injured in that battle, and to this day I cannot understand why I was not. His men were being blown to bits and shot to death on either side of me. Adrenaline was pumping full force. Now, Baker didn't hear from Captain Runyon again until July 4th, 1945, when Runyon, who was white, was inexplicably decorated with the Silver Star for his actions at Castle Aginilfi. Baker himself was given the Distinguished Silver Star, but he never spoke again to his former commanding officer. Um, and then, of course, that wrong was kind of righted with giving him the Medal of Honor. And he also said that he felt like the U.S. was definitely getting closer to racial equality, but we still had a ways to go. He said, yes, we have a long way to go before we are really together, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, and it is getting brighter. Now, as we uh, get towards the end of the uh, presentation, um, towards the end of the war is when we started to liberate the concentration camps. And the first camp that was liberated was Buchenwald. Buchenwald concentration camp was liberated on April 7, 1945, almost by accident, by a patrol led by Captain Frederick Keffer of the 9th Armored Infantry Battalion. His patrol was in a little village outside of Wimmer when they came across three Russians who were fighting two Germans with fists and knives. The Russians had tracked down the Germans who had imprisoned them at the nearby concentration camp. The Russians reported that thousands of prisoners were still located in the camp too sick or weak to escape, and that it was just 10 to 15 miles from where they were. Now, John Williams, uh, originally from Chicago, Illinois, and then he retired in Honolulu, Hawaii, he was one of the first soldiers at Buchenwald. And when he was at Texas Christian University in 1946, he wrote an essay about what he saw there called Concentration Camp Chaos. And he sent that essay to me. He said that to see a dead man is not horrible. However, an unbelievably ghastly reality is to see dead men walking, as in this prison where starvation was a favorite method of killing. An English-speaking German Jew, Mr. Bernstein, was an inmate of this institution. Mr. Bernstein met Williams at the gate of the prison, and he offered his services as a guide. Williams recalled, Bernstein had been a chemist in civilian life, and therefore he was assigned to Buchenwald Hospital laboratory, laboratory where inmates were inoculated with toxin and disease germs. Once the prisoners contracted diseases, 
They were used to furnish serum for frontline German soldiers. Bernstein assisted with this work, which was supervised by Nazi stormtroopers. Bernstein told Williams that his knowledge of chemistry saved his life inasmuch as he treated some of the dead bodies, making them non-poisonous. After treating the dead bodies, Bernstein confided that he ate some of them to keep from starving. Upon my honor, I do not believe that he lied, as no one would tell a lie such as that, Williams said. We were escorted to the sick wards of the camp, where all the prisoners beyond the working stage were taken. Buchenwald was a concentration labor starvation camp. All prisoners were field and factory laborers until they collapsed from lack of food. The prisoners were then taken to the sick wards to die. These wards were one-room barn-like buildings approximately a half the size of the Texas Christian University gym. Each ward had 2,000 to 3,000 dying men. These men were lying on the floors and in pigeonholed shelves built into the walls. There was no bedding, heat, medicine of any, any sort of attention given them. Several times daily, the death wagon was brought around the wards to collect the dead just as if they were garbage. Bodies were thrown onto the cart as if they were sacks of potatoes. Next, Bernstein took him to the crematorium where the bodies of the dead were destroyed. They were destroyed by coal fire in the camp, provided that there were no orders from the Denmark soap factories for the dead. Many trainloads of dead were shipped to the soap factories in Denmark and made into that ever scarce item. Other notable methods of death at Buchenwald were the gassing method, shooting, and the nail method. The latter method was a unique device for killing the condemned. Prisoners were lined up next to a wall according to their heights. The executioner pushed a lever and out of the wall shot a nail-like object into the head of each of the victims. The lever was then drawn back and the death house was again ready for more condemned men. These systems were used when the camp became overcrowded and starvation was too slow. This person was particularly a horrific individual. The commandant of Buchenwald was wed to a creature whose hobby was collecting tattoos. Her name was Elsa Koch. At intervals, the woman would wander through the camp searching for interesting tattoos on the chests and arms of the shirtless prisoners. If a tattoo appealed to Mrs. Horror, she would order the bearer of the tattoo to be shot. We saw many of the book covers, lampshades, pocketbooks, and bags made from this human tattooed skin. And that's right after Buchenwald was liberated, they put some of those objects on display. Now he was actually, you know, he's writing this for college. He was kind of polite in his paper. Most GIs referred to her as the bitch of Buchenwald. And she was tried at, at, at uh, Nuremberg and she was put in prison for life and committed suicide around 1961. She hung herself. Not a great loss. Barney Zilka from Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, it's my young family getting to visit him. He had helped to liberate Dachau. And his words were, don't let your family or anyone forget all of these atrocities. Teach them, tell them what I have told you here. I hate when people say, this never happened. Believe me, it did. It was real. And then Robert Erhart remembered that every man and woman who served in World War II was forever changed by their experiences. Some were permanently scarred on the outside, permanently disfigured. Those who were wounded on the inside often had scars that were deeper and more difficult to treat. Um, Erhart wrote, like many men who had been in combat, I never wanted to go again. When the Korean War started, I was asked to return, but by that time I was married with two children. I had had enough, for the dying did not stop with the peace treaty. Every so often after the war, you would hear of someone you had known committing suicide. Others drank themselves to death or ended up in a mental ward at the VA hospital. I was one of the lucky ones. And he wrote that, uh, come on here. Erhart was troubled by many memories from the war, not the least of which may have been what the war forced him to become. In a newspaper article he wrote called 100 D-Days, he pointed out that the young men who fought in World War II were really no more than boys and were certainly not born soldiers. In a few short weeks of training, they were forced to forget everything they had been taught by years of schooling 
religion, and sports programs. He wrote, they were going to have to pull the trigger on a rifle or a machine gun when they had a human being wearing a different color uniform in their sights. That was a natural repugnance to pull the trigger on another man. But even if he had a thousand voices inside him shouting no, he would do what he was trained to do. The only rule Erhart recalled in combat was that there were no rules and only one guideline. You should do everything you can to ensure your survival and everything you can to see that your enemy does not. And, whoops, Donald Chase um, of Framingham, Massachusetts, very lucky, he's still with us. He's close to, close to 100 years old, and we still talk on the phone. Um, but he wrote one of the things, he was both in World War II and in Korea, and he dealt with a lot of his uh, painful memories by writing poetry. And he wrote this poem, Dreams. Life is pleasant and sun shines bright light, but apprehension begins with the coming of the night. You fall asleep, but dreams fill your mind of days of terror once thought left behind, of days on an outpost in no man's land, seeing the pieces of what once was a man. Who he was, no one will know. Only part of his head and one hand show. The unseen mortar coughs up its shell followed by a blast that casts its spell. There is nowhere to go, no place to hide, as the screaming shrapnel spreads ever so wide. At last it's quiet, but you still hug the ground, shocked at first by the absence of sound. The heartbeat slows and you wake to find it's just another dream playing tricks with your mind. These scenes of battles from days long ago are kept buried inside so no one knows. And although you try with all your might, you can't stop the dreams that come with the night. And that was something that really hit me, is to think that, you know, 50 years, 60 years after, a lot of these guys were still struggling with dreams like that every night, and that the war doesn't really ever end. Whoops. And then this is just kind of a graph of how many people died in World War II, and, and just to also to point out, it really truly was a total war, there was actually more civilian deaths than soldier deaths even. Then as I think there, as their voices are, silent, are silenced by age, it is left for those of us who follow in their footsteps to tell their stories and to speak their names so that all that they have ever endured for, for us and for future generations will be remembered. As long as their stories are told, I think the veterans of World War II will live on. And as kind of a honor really to be able to share their stories and that's my uh, presentation if anybody has any questions and if you're interested in the book I have it over there it's on uh, $20 and uh, it's also on Amazon as well if you're ever interested there but if you'd like one tonight you could get one anybody have any questions how many people do you still correspond with well um, really had been three, um, and uh, um, Jim Doris, who I didn't tell his story tonight, but he has an incredible story. He was from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he was a liberator at Dachau concentration camp. But, um, and he was so horrified by what he saw at Dachau that he prayed. He said, God, please give me a sign that there's goodness even here. And right after that, an inmate walked up to him and asked him for a cigarette. Well, Doris had a pack of cigarettes, but he thought, I can't give this guy a cigarette because then everybody's going to come over here and want a cigarette. So he said, no, I don't have one. And then the inmate, the prisoner, the concentration camp prisoner said, wait a minute, ran and he came back and he had just a little butt of a cigarette. He said, here, thank you for liberating us. And he realized that that was like the guy's most pride, prized possession was that little cigarette butt and he was giving it to him. And for Jim Doris, that was a sign from God that there was goodness there. But he passed away in 2019, um, and uh, there's really only two left from the book that I still correspond with and that are still in, in good enough health. Murray Shapiro, who lives in Los Angeles, I didn't tell his story tonight, but his story is in the book. And then Donald Chase, who wrote that Dreams poem in Massachusetts, and he's still really 
very, very sharp. Remembers everything. What's interesting is some of these guys told me all these stories and then they would like end their letters saying, you know, I never told anybody this. You know, I never told my kids these stories. I never even told my wife. You know, and I think maybe it was sort of uh, therapeutic to tell somebody that they didn't even know, just kind of got it off their chest, maybe. You know, but because like one of the curious things is that starting to become friends with some of their children, <laughs> and the guy who just told his story, Jim Doris, I've really become quite close to his sons and. So they've kind of learned some of their dad's stories through me, even though they're older than me. <laughs> and kind of a fun thing. And, and that's kind of a neat thing. Very interesting. Thank you. All right, well, that's it. And you're welcome to take a look at some of these items. Thank you. And thank you guys for your service. It's just as important. And if you'd like to take a look at the books, you can too. Thank you.